Good day, good morning. Uh, this is Miss Cat coming at you to help you out with this lesson knocked out by making a video guide. So let's see what this is all about. What will we learn in this lesson? Imagine this. What would it be like to land on Mars? After six months on board your spacecraft, imagine you're finally about to land on Mars. While entering the atmosphere, you feel lightheaded and pressure moving into your lungs. This is blood rushing from your head to your feet due to entering Mars's gravity. When you finally land and stand, you feel dizzy. With more than a dozen critical tasks you need to complete in the first moments of landing on a red planet, you realize this is not a good sign. Moments later, the dizziness is too much for your body to overcome, and you faint, severely hindering your crew's ability to perform their mission. It's no good. But let's find out why this happens. What's going on? Fainting upon landing is a significant concern for astronauts. Fainting can render astronauts immobile during a mission's critical moments, such as landing on Mars which can drastically hinder a mission's success. As commander of your crew, you will have to ask yourself, why might this happen? Think about what causes someone to faint in the first place. Have you ever fainted or felt lightheaded before? If so, what happened? Yeah, I am curious. I've never fainted before, so... So was it a stressful situation? Getting up suddenly from lying down? Um, this is me. I'm like, hmm... <laughs> I want to study this. Was it the sight of blood, extreme pain on a roller coaster? I have thrown up at the end of a roller coaster. That was super embarrassing. On my friend Gabby, she was not happy. What's going on? Why? What might someone be feeling in this situation? Okay. Then you just do this. But anyway, if you felt that way. This person's fainted twice from a stressful situation, felt lightheaded and dizzy during the event. So what happens? For some people, just the simple act of standing up suddenly or sitting or lying down for a long time can cause lightheadedness. This difficulty in standing upright is called, oh, orthostatic intolerance. Intolerance? Maybe? I've never heard this word, intolerance. Oh, lots of typos here, so let's just go check it out. Intel, yeah, okay. Typo. Anyway, this condition is quite similar to the one that causes astronauts to faint when they land back on Earth, but possibly on the surface of Mars. What do you predict is going on in your body to make you feel dizzy or faint in the situation mentioned above? Could it be too little blood in your muscles? Too little blood in your brain. A lack of vitamin C, changes in the pressure of flow of blood, overworkers your muscles, or an infection. That's my guess. Changes in the pressure of flow of blood. Luckily, the team at the Infinity Space Center has already begun to look at this strange phenomenon. Take a look at the latest ROS report from Mission Control to get a better idea of how fainting can hinder a mission to Mars. The key issue is fainting. The target system is the cardiovascular system that's bringing blood to the heart and around the body, oxygenated cardiovascular. Cause of concern, the possibility of fainting upon landing on Mars will render astronauts immobile. This will not only jeopardize the health of crew members, but it can also prevent them from completing mission critical tasks once they land. Case studies, Dania Carmen, Karim. I remember a little while after returning back from Earth, I had to give a talk on the success of my mission. As I got up on the podium, I felt incredibly dizzy and lightheaded. Next thing you know, I had people all over me picking me up off the floor all around me. <laughs> Early data from the laboratory. Standing test on landing day. 
so standing test. Basically, can you stand without fail without fainting? Something. Um, it seems like on a longer duration, 80% fail. The more people fail, it's a long duration. And here we have a model of response after landing post space flight. So here we have blood pressure is the squiggly blue lines. And model of response after landing. It seems like you have a little bit of a dip after you land in your blood pressure. And then that dip spikes your heart rate and then has it go down and then it goes up again. And then it goes down. So we just learned in our last lesson, right, that blood pressure is homeostatically controlled by the heart rate. So the blood pressure changes and that changes the heart rate in order to get more blood to the body. You have less blood pressure, your heart's gonna need to pump faster to get the same amount of blood and oxygen in. In our research, the major, major symptom of concern is fainting because an astronaut could get hurt. The crew at the Space Center tries to keep astronauts from standing once they land on Earth. Take a closer look at the position this astronaut is placed in. This may be important in preventing fainting. Oh, interesting. Wow, this is a really interesting phenomenon. I didn't know this happened. Which statement makes the most sense based on the evidence you have obtained from this report? Astronauts returning from Mars will be less likely to pass a standing test than astronauts returning from the moon. That seems right. Longer durations have a higher chance of not passing. Fainting can be a mission critical issue, yes. Data shows that astronauts tend to faint when trying to stand shortly after landing back on Earth. Yeah. The cardiovascular system may be linked to the risk of fainting. Seems likely. I'm going to explore this connection. Our goal is to find out what's happening. We'll fo focus on blood flow changes. And we should be able to devise a way to prevent this from happening. Mission and a countermeasure. <clears throat> okay, so you can either refresh your memory or you can dive right in. Let's go ahead and dive right in. The body's delivery system. In addition to providing the body with nutrients, the cardiovascular system also removes waste and harmful byproducts created by the cells. Byproducts such as carbon dioxide and urea are carried by the blood before they are moved to the lungs and kidneys. Okay, so nutrients that we need are oxygen, then glucose, waste are our urea and CO2. I'm gonna go ahead and write that down in my notes. So why do we need this system? Humans do not have a cell membrane. We do. Blood needs to be supplied to the upper layer of skins only. No. Nutrients carried in the blood need to reach all cells, which some are at the bottom layer. Mm -hmm. And the cardiovascular system doesn't give the body shape and structure. Can you think of which system does that instead? This is pretty interesting to look at all these different layers of your skin. So here's your epidermis, your underneath, or your top, on top of the dermis, and the hypodermis is below. Cardiovascular system is needed to deliver nutrients to the cells. How is oxygen delivered? As you've seen, one of the key roles of the cardiovascular system is to transport oxygen. Cells need oxygen to conduct aerobic respiration, a product by which cells generate energy. We assume that oxygen is carried by the blood, but where exactly in the blood is oxygen held? Centrifuge the vial of blood on the right to find out how oxygen is delivered throughout the body. Ooh, here we go. Centrifuge is just spinning something really fast so that the heavier layers go to the bottom and the 
lighter layers go to the top. We saw centrifugation when we looked at the nesselson stahl experiment of trying to figure out how DNA is conserved, how is it replicated. We found that it was semi-conservative, meaning one new strand is made from the old strand. All right, so here we got our different layers. We have plasma, a yellowish liquid, 91% water, also contains proteins and trace amounts of glucose, calcium, and other metabolites. There's a Buffy coat, the Buffy the Vampire Slayers in here. I don't think any of you guys would have watched that, probably, maybe? Anyway, this tiny layer contains white blood cells, which fight off disease, and platelets that patch up blood, damaged blood vessels. And then finally, our red blood cells. They contain hemoglobin, a molecule that can carry oxygen. And so the oxygen there is held in the red blood cells, and I'm going to go ahead and write down those layers. Three layers, many molecules. Your body can separate into three layers. Of all the layers that your blood can be found in these three layers, from white blood cells that fight disease to proteins like hemoglobin, which carry molecules of oxygen. Match the components of blood to the layer it contains. All right, so we got water and plasma, oxygen and red blood cells. Calcium in the plasma, white blood cells in the buffy layer, glucose is in the plasma. Oops. Red blood cells make up the red blood. Ooh, construct the system. So far, you've learned that oxygen is a critical molecule. All cells require this, especially the brain, and it produces ATP. It's possible that oxygen transportation is why astronauts may faint. So exactly how does this vital molecule travel? It could be over 60,000 miles. What? 60,000 miles of blood vessels? Let me write that down. That's a weird fact. The while. Um, okay. All right, so this is kind of cool. Let's go ahead and piece this together. At the center is my guess that's the heart and then the oxygen is going to leave the heart from the aorta and go to the rest of the body this is the systemic back to the body right system systemic then once it's deprived of all oxygen it's going to trace its way back to the heart to be pumped to the lungs pulmonary and at the lungs it's going to collect oxygen it's going to um, then get brought back into the, remember how it's backwards? It looks like it's on the right, but this is the left atrium. It's gonna go through the cuspid valve. I think this is the tricuspid valve or by, I forget. Um, and then it's gonna go out to the rest of the heart. It's gonna make the circuit. So on one side, we have the systemic and on the other side, we have the pulmonary. Labeling the system. Um, we have arteries. It's a blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart. Artery away. Vein towards the heart. The heart has four chambers. Upper two are, are called atria, and the bottom two are called ventricles. And I remember that because the bottom looks like a V. And an atrium, if you've ever been in an atrium in like a hotel, that's where people collect and gather before they go up to their rooms. So number one. That is the, remember it's backwards, so it's flipped, left ventricle. Number two, that is the, so left ventricle goes out to the artery that goes away from the body. Then it goes back via a vein, number three, to enter the um, right atrium. The right atrium lets it into the big pumping mechanism, that ventricle, the right ventricle. It's going to go out to the lungs via, it's going away, so that's an artery, and then it's going to come back via a vein to the heart. 
And eight is the holding cell, the left atrium. Okay, so um, if you can see my notes here, artery means away, vein means towards, and I drew literally something that looks like a heart here, and I divided it into four. Top are the atria, bottom are the ventricles, and then it's flip-flopped, left, right. So on the right side of my page is the left, on the left side of my page is the right. And then I drew the course of the blood. So the blood's going to come from the lungs to the left atria, left atria to left ventricle to the body with oxygen. From the body on this side over here, from the body back into the right atria to the right ventricle to the lungs to pick up more oxygen, and then repeats from the lungs back to the left atria, left atria, left ventricle, left ventricle body to deliver oxygen. Deoxygenated blood comes back from the body from this side to the right atria, right atria to ventricle, right ventricle back to the lungs to get more oxygen, lungs back to the left atria, to the left ventricle, back to the body. And that happens like literally, can you feel your heartbeat? That's what's happening. I remember the systole, the systole is when um, there's the contraction and the diastole when there's the filling. Sys oh, I, I'm going to write that down too. Systole, contraction, diastole, filling. Okay, so look at the oxygen rich blood is pumped from your heart to left your body. So that's the systemic circulation. Um, let's match the appropriate description here. Here's the systemic. So we're going out of the left ventricle. That left ventricle contains oxygen, rich blood flowing out of the heart. And then it's going to the body. Oxygen from the blood is delivered to cells all over the body. Um, when it gets to the body, we get into these smaller blood vessels called capillaries. Um, This is where it's going to return through the right atrium. Oh, okay. That's what's going on here. This is where it's delivered. And then this is just the step of saying oxygen rich blood um, trace leaves the heart via arteries. That makes sense. Okay, so let us put this into words. Oxygen-rich blood leaves the heart through the left ventricle. Oxygenated blood leaving the heart travels through vessels called arteries away. Once blood reaches capillaries, oxygen can be delivered to the cells. Blood returns to the heart through vessels called veins. The deoxygenated blood then enters back through the heart um, through the right atrium and that's the system and since it's tracking back it needs more oxygen it's like out of breath <gasps> we need to go to the pulmonary circuit so now the pulmonary circuit this is has to do with lungs um so same sort of thing's gonna happen here we're gonna move from zone zone in here on the right ventricle we have oxygen, poor blood, pumped out of the heart's right ventricle. It's going to go over to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Okay, away from the heart, traveling through the pulmonary artery. We're then exchanging blood. We're getting through these capillaries by osmosis. The oxygen is going to go from high to, or not osmosis necessarily, but diffusion. It's going to go from high to low oxygen concentration. And we're going to get rid of waste. So we're going to do a big exchange here in the lungs. And that's as you breathe out, you get rid of all your CO2. As you breathe in, you breathe in all that oxygen. So that exchange happens down here in the capillaries. 
So then it's sent back by the pulmonary vein. Remember, vein is going back towards the heart. And it enters the heart's left atrium. Okay, so now we know oxygen is vital. Cardiovascular system transport oxygen and astronauts faint. With this information, let's figure out what's going on. Astronauts tend to faint when they return to Earth because they're shifting between an environment of weightlessness to being pulled back down by Earth's gravity. So here we have floating, the G's, gravity is 3.711 mil uh, meters per second squared. That's the force that objects are gonna fall, the time distance over time that they're gonna fall to the moon. And this is 9.8 meters per second, force of gravity. Um, on Earth. And I'll share with you guys, I'll show you dropping a feather and a hammer on the moon and Earth. What's going to be the difference? We have mainly the gravity, but what's going to be the difference then between the feather and the hammer? That's your question. And without any surface area, surface uh, air resistance basically pressed up on the surface of these two uh, objects they'll fall at the same rate and moon doesn't have any as dense of an atmosphere as the earth does. well more accurate to say potentially that the moon doesn't have have an atmosphere but uh, the molecules that are on the surface are easily lost to space so for example helium would gain enough energy from the sun that it would bounce right off and float back out outer space. So brain break if you want to pause here and go check out that video that it okay. Their commentary is kind of funny. I bet you can't Why? How about that? Let them bounce around. It's kind of fun. There's less gravity. Okay, cool. So that was an aside, but so we're transitioning back to Earth here. Um, why would we experience an increase? When would they in experience that increase in the gravitational pull? Is it transitioning from Earth to microgravity? Um, transitioning from microgravity to Mars, transitioning from Mars back to microgravity, transitioning from microgravity back to Earth is what we're looking for. Oh my god, I feel kind of silly. This isn't the moon, this is Mars, but similar things apply. Similar things to what I just said apply. Um, and so we also might feel that same transition from Mars back to microgravity. Wait, no microgravity to Mars. So we're looking for the sudden pull. So if we go from microgravity to Mars, that's a sudden pull still. If we go from microgravity to Earth, sudden pull. Um, even if we went, I mean, obviously we couldn't, but from Mars to Earth directly. So why does this happen in the first place? It has to do with blood distribution. The root cause of fainting when you try to stand or orthostatic intolerance is not fully understood. However, many scientists believe it is related to the flow of blood and oxygen you just explored and how it changes during spaceflight. On Earth, most of the blood and fluid in our bodies pool in our legs. That's the diagram here. We see more red down here. How do you think transitioning from Earth to microgravity would affect the distribution of blood in our bodies? Okay, so... Normally, it's all 
falling, it's being pulled down. But then if we go from space to being pulled down again, I bet it's going to look something like, see, it's going to be pulled down even more away from our brains into our feet. Puffy faces, thin legs, and more. <laughs> in space, norm blood normally pooled in the feet shifts upward, collecting in the chest and head. This shift in fluid volume can manifest in a number of ways. Take a look. Okay, so see if we can see what's going on here. Here's some astronauts whose face looks kind of puffy. Interesting. I guess here I'm seeing swole, like puffy face too, but maybe more so swollen arteries through this artery. Oh, this is her in space. More blood's going up there. And here you can, I guess we're trying to see his thin legs. Go ahead and make a prediction. How do you predict the blood in the body will move when it suddenly feels the force of gravity upon landing on Mars or when returning to Earth after having spent months in space in microgravity? Okay, so same thing here, being pulled down. The blood shifts through the field of gravity. How might the brain respond? Okay, so oxygen distribution to the upper body is limited. The brain becomes deprived of oxygen. Fainting will result in lack of oxygen. Okay, and then this one's probably here first. Returning to gravity shifts fluids to the lower, uh, lower body. So let's go ahead and shift these down one. Fainting is a result. Brain becoming deoxygenated because all of that fluid has been shifted to the lower body. Oxygen distribution limited. Cool. So how do we solve this? Let's pause and reflect really quick. How confident are we on the components of the blood, the cardiovascular system? You've taken notes. You have something to refer to if you want to use this for your DBA. We need oxygen in each one of our cells, even deep layers. And then we have pooling of the blood at the bottom of your feet, which takes it away from the brain. All right, so here's some solutions, some conclusions. Uh, given the sudden shift in gravity, the blood pools in the legs, okay. Which of the following is a plausible way to counteract this condition? We take a multivitamin. Probably it wouldn't hurt, but wouldn't necessarily help this particular problem. Anti-G suits provide extra compression so the blood doesn't pool. That seems like a really good thing. And then weight training, oh, again, good, good thing to do, but probably is not going to help it. And this is used by pilots, um, but also can be used for astronauts. All right, and in summary, okay, it says spacesuits like the one shown here prevent too much blood from pooling down to lower parts of the body. Although spacesuits today can't completely prevent fainting, I wonder how it does that. So anti-gravity spacesuit, I feel like I want to learn more about this. Okay, and then go ahead and summarize there what we just found. And uh, I think that's the end of the lesson here. Okay, so I guess you can see me type here. Fluid pools at the bottom of your legs or your lower body, maybe is more accurate. Lower body. When returning to gravity, um, this brings blood away from the brain, leading 
be freezing. Oh, fainting because all cells need oxygen and the brain is not getting enough. When a person shifts or an astronaut shifts from microgravity to the pull of gravity, something like that. All right, and finally your turn. Reflect on what we learned so far. So, okay, we're, we need to revisit the spacecraft selection. Each of the spacecrafts available has some way of decreasing the possibility of astronauts fainting. These preventative measures are shown to the, at the heart icon on the spacecraft page. Okay, however, we will need more than that. Select a spacecraft that has a wide range of tools that can help you on your trip. Okay. So some solutions include saline solution, ludocortisone, and midodrine, midodrine tablets, or an anti-gravity space suit. Okay, so we want to make sure that our spacecraft has one of those. I'm going to go into my mission. Here's our spacecraft. I selected this anti-gravity suit, but maybe I want Midodrain too. Hmm. Okay, so I think here's the most important thing. When you go to my mission and you select your spacecraft, um, okay, I'm gonna open it up again. We're going to go back to the spacecraft. Here we are. Select your spacecraft. This is what I selected. I'm going to go into the details, and I'm going to edit my reason for selection. You can only finish this unit once you have. Um, you can type in a reason for, for selecting that, and I specifically talked about this anti-gravity suit. So once you've done that, then you are ready to go, and that's how you finish the lesson. All right. Well, um, I hope that helped you guys. It is Wednesday morning, so you should be able to finish that by this Sunday. And that we only have one lesson left, which is really cool. Really excited for you to come to the talk that's on Thursday of my neighbor. Um, he, my old neighbor from childhood, going to school for cardiology. I think he'll be able to give us a really cool insight into all the stuff we just learned. Um, so neat. All right, I will see you on Friday.